last uh, keynote session of uh, the EIEE uh, 2021 uh, online session. Uh, I will uh, first uh, give uh, the floor to uh, Professor James Smith, uh, which is the EIEE president uh, for uh, a couple of introductory talk. And then I will uh, go back on stage to uh, present the, the speakers of this, uh, of this session. So uh, please, uh, James, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Yannick. Uh, I want to wish good morning and good afternoon and good evening to all of you. Uh, send my best wishes out to you wherever you may be located at the moment. I know we have a broad audience uh, and we appreciate all of you. My name is James Smith and as president of IAEE this year, it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to our 43rd annual international conference. There really has hardly been a more exciting and interesting and important time to have this event. The uh, uncertainties that surround the energy transition and climate change and complicated by the pandemic really do command our full attention. Uh, and uh, the, so many questions arise. So what is the energy transition? When will it occur? How will it affect the climate? Uh, will there be an impact on economic growth, social welfare? These questions and so many more like those uh, have been uh, structured into our program uh, and the plenary sessions as well as the concurrent sessions, we invite you to join where these will be examined in great detail. Uh, speaking as an economist, just for a minute, I want to mention two concepts that are important uh, as we grope for solutions to our problems. The first, of course, is externalities the concept of externalities. We all know what that means. We all recognize that it goes to the heart of almost every discussion of climate change and policy options. But the second concept I wanna emphasize is opportunity cost. And that of course recognizes that any choice we make comes at the expense of other things that must be left behind. Economics has been defined as the study of how limited resources are used to satisfy unlimited wants. Uh, and I think that's very relevant uh, as, we, as we grope for solutions to our current problems. If we were so fortunate to have enough resource endowments to be able to afford every good thing, life would be easy because we would not have to choose among alternatives. And then there would be very little real work for economists to do. Uh, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately for economists, but unfortunately, that's not the world we live in. And we must think and choose very carefully from among the alternatives that are available to us. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in, in keeping with one of the major themes of the conference, uh, let me illustrate with an example drawn from the pandemic. We know that it would be good if the elderly and other uh, people whose health is compromised could have both doses of the vaccine as soon as possible. But we also know that it would be good if younger and healthy people could get at least one dose of the vaccine as soon as possible. These are both good things. Uh, they're both desirable in their own right, but we can't have it both ways. We have to choose among the alternatives. And by committing to one, we give up the other. This is really the, the type of trade-off that lies behind all economic decision-making. My point here is simply to say that we as economists must be very careful when we are identifying and studying the beneficial impacts of a given policy whether that pertains to climate change or to income distribution, uh, public health, any of these areas, we must be careful also to identify just what that policy requires us to give up. We take the chosen path instead of what? What's the opportunity cost? We have not done our job and society cannot make sound decisions until both parts of the analysis are complete. That is to say, until we have answered the question, instead of what? Now let me turn to another very important subject, and that is the fact that many people and organizations have contributed in important ways to the success of this conference, and we're so grateful to all of them. 
Uh, some of them you will meet uh, during the course of the conference. Many are behind the scenes, but I want to especially uh, acknowledge the help we've received from several organizations who've pitched in in a large measure. First, we've been assisted by three main strategic partners, and those three include Electricity de France, uh, the company Engie, which uh, many of you recognize was formed by the merger of Gas de France and Suez some years ago. And the third main strategic partner is Total, or as it's known since last week, I guess, Total Energies. So we appreciate their support, but we also want to acknowledge two special strategic and knowledge partners that have contributed. Uh, the first of those being Enedis, which is the, uh, the organization that oversees the French electric distribution system. And the second being CAPSARC, the King Abdullah Petroleum Studies and Research Center in Saudi Arabia. And then three other partners that have pitched in as well, the BP company, we thank you. RTE, which is the system operator of the French transmission network. And finally, Tariga, which is a major European gas transport and storage company. And in addition, we owe special thanks to the French Ministry for Ecologic Transition and to the French Association for Energy Economics, which is, of course, our uh, French affiliate of the IAEE. So we thank you all. And with that, I again welcome you to the conference and invite you to explore the many aspects and sessions here. And I now turn the session back over to Yannick Perez, the General Conference Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, James, uh, for uh, this uh, smart and bold kind words of introduction. Uh, we are now uh, moving to um, the, the presentation of uh, what will be the, uh, the core of this, uh, of this opening and keynote session number one. Uh, we will have um, four uh, uh, presentations, uh, one from uh, Patrick Pouyanné, which is uh, the Total Energy uh, CIO. Then uh, Laura Cozy will uh, will give us um, <clears throat> the, the the net zero emission uh, scenario uh, made by the uh, International Energy Association uh, Agency. Then Edward Miguel from uh, University of California Berkeley. And then uh, to close the session, we will. Uh, have the presentation of uh, Claudia Kempfert from the uh, IW uh, Berlin on the coal exit in Germany. So we will have uh, very uh, complementary uh, approaches to deal with uh, uh, energy transitions in times of COVID with different perspectives coming from different audiences. So um, I think we could start with uh, the Patrick Spuyane uh, presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, I am honored to speak before you today about this film, Energy Transitions in Times of COVID. I'm not a COVID specialist, so I shall speak essentially of the energy transition, but I see a dual link between both. Both are global phenomena that must be addressed by all countries. COVID-19 has accelerated change in many activities and has been Oops. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to speak before you today about this film, Energy Transitions in Times of COVID. I'm not a COVID specialist, so I shall speak essentially of the energy transition, but I see a dual link between both. Both are global phenomena that must be addressed by all countries. COVID-19 has accelerated change in many activities and has been a stark reminder about the fragility of our planet. At the time, we did not discover the climate problem in 2020. Long time ago, we were engaged in the climate change, and five years ago, when we were the first major oil company to issue a climate report and integrate the objective of the Paris Agreement into a strategy, that of limiting global warming to well below two degrees versus the pre-industrial era levels. Last year, Total adopted a new climate ambition that underpins its strategy, which is to supply more energy with less emissions and therefore to become a multi-energy group. 
In this framework, I would like to discuss with you three topics. The challenges facing the world's energy, first. Second, total strategy to respond to these challenges and the condition for a successful energy transition. The world is facing a dual challenge. On the one hand, there is an ever-increasing demand for energy because of a growing population and aiming to a better way of life. On the other hand, there is an urgency to reduce emissions and face climate change. Global population will increase by 2 billion by 2050 with improved standards of living and thus more energy consumed. This is especially true for 800 million people on the planet who currently still do not have access to electricity. Energy is an essential good. We need it for mobility, eating, lighting and communication. Energy is a precursor for economic and social development. Of course, energy efficiency will absorb part of this growing demand, but not of it. It will require more than 3 to 4 percent of energy efficiency per year while mankind on long period did not manage to do more than 2 percent. We estimate that energy demand will grow by 20 percent by 2050. The challenge for energy companies like Total is to meet this demand by providing an ever more affordable, reliable and clean energy. The climate challenge then, in the last 20 years CO2 emissions have increased by more than 50 percent. Temperatures have already increased by one degree since the pre-industrial era and are on a trend to continue to rise by three to four degrees by the end of the century. All for the Paris Agreement fixed the objective to limit the rise well below two degrees. Between 2010 and 2019, emissions fell in North America by almost 10% and in Europe by 16%. But at the same time, they rose sharply in the Middle East, plus 25%, in China, 24%, and in India, plus 47%. China alone accounts for 28% of global emissions. 2020 marked an historic halt with a 6% drop in global emissions, roughly the same percentage drop as global GDP. That being said, decarbonization by degrowth is not a solution because as the pandemic demonstrating, it has an exorbitant cost. The number of countries, cities and businesses with a global carbon neutral target for 2050 doubled in 2020 and now covers around 70% of global CO2 emission. Among them is the European Union, with an intermediate target of 55% less emissions by 2030. China, as well, has expressed its willingness to be carbon neutral by 2060, and the United States are back in the Paris Agreement. And other countries, I'm sure, will benefit from the COP26 in next November to redefine their climate ambitions. Generating more than 60% of CO2 emissions, so the energy sector is at the forefront of the fight against the climate change. And so let me now speak about the ways in which Total integrates these two challenges of energy one demand on one side and climate change in, in, in the other side. The world's dilemma is simple to state, more energy, less carbon. And this dilemma is exactly what the trial strategy aims to address. We have decided to turn the climate constraint into an opportunity by transforming Total into Total Energies, a multi-energy group a company. In order to anchor this transformation in our identity, Total very recently changed its name again to Total Energies. What is the climate ambition of Total Energies? Our ambition is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 on our operations and products sold to customers together with society. And I'm, it means it encompasses COP 1, 2, and 3. This new strategy has been largely supported at our shareholders meeting a few days ago. Our new logo with seven colors, from red to yellow, represents the plurality of energies, as well as a journey in motion to carbon neutrality. We will therefore have to act on three axes. Our operations, our products, the energy we produce, and our customers' demand, the energy that our customers consume. Our first ambition is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 on emissions generated by our global operations, SCOP 1 and 2, with a 2030 objective, which is quite ambitious again, of 40% reductions versus 2050. Our second ambition is to achieve carbon neutrality by 2050 from the products sold to our customers, SCOP 3, with a 2030 objective of a 20% reduction of the carbon intensity of our mix of products versus 2015. 
of fuel ambition is to achieve also carbon neutrality on all our activities in Europe, scope 1 and 2 and 3 by 2050, with a 2030 objective of a 30% reduction versus 2015. Scope 1 and 2 is now essential to our business. Reducing scope 3, which is 10 times higher than our scope 1 and 2, requires close cooperation with our customers because our scope 3 is their scope 1 and 2. An example of this is the flight we organized a few days ago with Airbus and Air France KLM uses 16% of biojet fuels produced at our zero fuel refinery of La Med. A multi-energy company, what does that mean? That means that uh, for decades, total strategy has been driven by supply. Discover more hydrocarbons, put them into production, and bring them to market. Our strategy is now driven by demand because the exchange of energy demand patterns. The demand for energy will increase, but it will move towards more electricity and we think as well natural gas and away from oil. Total will meet this demand by continuing to grow uh, in terms of energy production by around 30% between the next decade, from 17 petajoules per day to 23 petajoules per day, a new unit which represents a mix of energies, modifying the mix offers to our customers. We will reduce sales of oil products by 20, 30% in 2030 compared to 2020 and focus on two pillars for growth, renewables on one side, LNG on the other side. This choice was tested in 2020. Why world energy demand decreased by 4%, two energies experienced growth last year. Renewable electricity, 13% increase, and LNG, 3%, driven by China and India. Our investment policy is quite simple. Out of the 12 to 13, 16 billion dollars we'll invest in this year and coming years, half shall be dedicated to just the maintenance of our operations in hydrocarbons, and the other half will be for growth. And this growth will be allocated half of it to renewables and electricity, and the other half to LNG. The commitment to tot from Total Energy is to renewable is strong. For five years, we have been building a current portfolio in renewables. Our portfolio has more than double, today reaching 7 gigawatts, and we have already our projects in our portfolio that will bring this capacity to 35 gigawatts in 2025. By 2030, we aim to have installed a gross installed capacity of 100 gigawatts. By way of comparison, the French nuclear fleet has a total installed capacity of 62 gigawatts. This will need to mobilize around 60 billion dollars of financing all these investments over the next decade to reach this capacity and will place ourselves as one of the top five renewable players in the world. The second priority is LNG. The energy transition will not happen overnight, it will take decades. And during this period, natural gas will play a pivotal role in lowering emissions without compromising energy security. Replacing coal with gas for electricity generation reduces emissions by 50%. Coal currently represents 26% of the global energy mix. 14% only in Europe, but 60% in China, and 43% of electricity generation. Gas complements renewable energy by compensating for intermittency and by responding to the seasonality of electricity demand. Natural gas can be also be used as a cleaner alternative to oil-based fuels in many industries, for example in maritime transport. The energy market is now globalized with many more players than 20 years ago. 45 countries now have import capacities. Of course, great care is required to further reduce methane leakage. Total is already a leader in this area with an emission intensity of less than 0.1% for its upstream gas production. But more can be done in particular in the LNG plants. Other investments will be to support or growth in low carbon technologies. Batteries, because the storage of electricity will be key to overcome the intermittence of renewable energies. Total has also launched the ACC company, which is to produce batteries for EVs development in electric mobility with an ambition to install 150,000 charging points by 2025. We want to be recognized in electric mobility as we are today in marketing gasoline. Hydrogen, because it's an energy carrier that can be used to store electricity generated from renewables. And the more we have renewables, the more we need storage. Currently, 95% of the hydrogen consumed is grey. Green hydrogen made from renewables power is currently 5 to 10 times more expensive than grey hydrogen. 
It's therefore necessary to develop markets to create economies of scales in order to reduce the cost of low carbon hydrogen. I should also speak about carbon sinks because the world will still need fossil fuels in 2050 in all the scenarios. Total aims to capture and store 3 to 5 million tons of CO2 by 2030 is, and is already involved in several CO2 capture and reinjection projects, including Northern Lights in Norway. We are also working on natural carbon sinks. We have just signed a partnership in Congo for the planting of a new 45,000 hectares forest in Congo. Of course, we need also to continue and to maintain a certain level of activity investments in our traditional activities, I mean the hydrocarbons, because the world will still need oil in 2050, much less than today, around 30 million barrels per full per day, according to the last scenario, but it's still uh, a lot to be produced. Total Energies will therefore also continue to produce oil, admittedly much less than today, and with increasing share of biofuels. To those who would like to see us exit oil quickly, I will say if Total Energies were to divest all of its oil assets today, others would take them over and risk being less concerned about the environment. We must continue to invest in oil projects because a drop in global demand, which we estimate at 2% per year from 2030, will be less strong than the natural decline of production of existing fields around mi minus 4 or minus 5%. Our fossil fuel assets generate the cash needed to invest in the energy transition, $3 billion in 2021, an amount that we intend to continue to increase in future years. Our renewable investments have rates of return of equity of over 10%, but it will take a decade before they generate substantial cash flows. What are the conditions of success to conclude of this energy transition? It's underway, but it will take time. It will require, of course, technological advances, particularly in the fields of energy, storage, hydrogen, CO2 capture, storage, and AI. Infrastructure developments are ways, electricity and gas networks, interconnections between countries, electrolyzers to manufacture green hydrogen, underground CO2 storage, charging points for electric vehicles, and so on. It will require to secure, to secure some supply chain, especially for raw materials, copper, lithium, cobalt, zinc, and rare minerals needed to develop renewable technologies the mobilization of considerable financial resources as well. Increased cooperation between governments, companies, research centers, university, financial community, civil society. It will require support from governments in the form of standards of subsidies to develop markets and create economies of scale to reduce costs, as was the case with renewable energies. In this sense, the European recovery plans, 37% of which being will be allocated to the energy transition is an historic opportunity. Carbon pricing, last but not least, is absolutely necessary to successfully decarbonize the world as it is a major lever for decarbonizing electricity generation and promoting low emission technologies. Finally, there must be an acceptance by people that the energy transition will have a cost. We will remember 2020 as a year that global investments in energy transition technologies over 500 billion dollars exceeded those in fossil fuels for the first time. 2020 has given us a unique opportunity. One must be seized quickly. Coal consumption is already picking up driven by Asia after a 4% drop in 2020. The transition must be accelerated if we want to stay within the Paris Agreement's objective. Of course, the cost of the transition will be several trillion dollars but it will be far less than the cost of inaction. The climate is clearly at the heart of total energy strategy. These are not words. Between uh, 2015 and 2022, we reduce our scope one and two already by 15%, and we intend to go deeper, down to 40% by 2030. To conclude, I would like to stress that the first conditions for a company's sustainability is its economic performance. Total was able to demonstrate great resilience in 2020 with a break-even point of $25 per barrel, without cutting staff, reducing our investments in renewable and maintaining our dividend. The pursuit of profit is needed for Total Energy to contribute to the energy transition. Sustainable development and carbon neutrality together with society, these are the two challenges that Total Energy's responsible energy company strives to address. Thank you.
Thank you. And now we uh, are going to move to the, the second um, speech by Laura Cosi. Hello, it's a great pleasure to uh, share with you our uh, latest report on uh, Net Zero by 2050 that we just released uh, a couple of weeks ago. So first of all, let me um, start uh, with the, the big levers that we have used uh, um, while analyzing what does it mean for the energy sector to get to uh, net zero by 2050. And to do so, we compared our scenario with the uh, IPCC ones. And just to give you a bit of a visual impression here, uh, we are using less carbon capture and storage, uh, much less carbon dioxide re removal and the lowest level of bioenergy compared to comparable IPCC scenario. What does that mean? Scenarios that reach not only uh, net zero, uh, uh, energy related CO2 emissions by 2050, but that are part of the 1.5 uh, family of scenarios the IPCC uh, put out. If you look at the uh, uh, more uh, final consumption levers, we have lower uh, final energy use, which means we are pushing efficiency more, there's higher level of electrification. And as you can see here, more hydrogen and more wind uh, and solar. So what do we find in terms of uh, achievability of uh, net zero by 2050. Very clearly, the next decade is uh, the one where we need to make a lot of efforts. But the good news is that uh, uh, to achieve the 13 gigaton of emission reduction that uh, are needed, we have all the technologies that would be needed to make this big, big decline in emission. Not only, many of those technologies are currently already more competitive than the polluting alternative. So what we're saying in this report, the finding of this report, uh, the pathway to net zero by 2050 is narrow, but still achievable. What do we need to do? First of all, we need to decarbonize the electricity sector. Solar and wind are now the cheapest technologies to produce electricity in many parts of the world. What we need to do with solar and wind is to quadruple what we have installed in 2020, which was the record here in terms of solar and wind installation. This is not new to the industry, a quadrupling in size uh, has happened already over the past decade, clearly with smaller amounts, but this is something that the industry has already done. We need to repeat the same success for this decade. So deploy, deploy, deploy solar and wind, quadruple the installation by 2030. While we decarbonize the electricity sector, it means that we have a low carbon vector, a low carbon energy that we can utilize in terms of end uses and would bring decarbonization at end use side as well. So the obvious place to start is uh, um, passenger transport, is cars. Our latest data that tracked the first quarter of 2021, January to March this year, we uh, basically counted 6% of cars sold globally were electric. This share needs to grow in the next decade to 60%. Over the past two years, uh, all 18 out of 20, out of 20 major um, car manufacturers have enhanced incredibly the amount of uh, EV offering on the market. One, uh, if you add them all up, uh, we are still, um, 50% short of what we would need in 2030. So we would need a doubling of the offering uh, that it's uh, on the market. Um, we have countries that uh, are achieving this level of market share, uh, showing us the path of what policy could be needed to achieve this large penetration of uh, electric vehicles. Norway is one of those examples. Uh, very clearly, we need to push at the same time energy efficiency. The type of energy intensity improvement that we would need to see to achieve net zero by 2050 is 4% on average a year. To give a bit of more uh, tangible uh, idea of what does this mean, this uh, means, for example, that we need to retrofit uh, one in five buildings globally. We are more or less on track for one out of 20, but we know the technology there, the labor is there, is only about policies and enacting those policies quickly. Another example would be uh, LEDs. We will need to achieve 100% sales of 
uh, LEDs in the market by 2025. Again, the technology is there, is about big uh, market push. Now, those uh, big push for clean energy technologies have implications and translations for uh, the incumbent technology. So what we find, for example, in the power sector, that by the end of this year, we would no, need, no longer need the FIDs for uh, new unabated coal fire power plants uh, globally. Um, if you look at the uh, boilers in our homes, uh, this would mean that by 2025, mid of this decade, we would no longer need new sales of coal or oil or um, fossil fuel based in general uh, boilers in our homes. Uh, later on, by the mid uh, 2035, uh, we wouldn't no longer need sales of uh, internal combustion engine. What do we need to achieve this big uh, uh, clean energy push is clearly investments. Um, our executive di director unveiled this number earlier this year uh, at the President Biden Climate Summit. We would need a tripling of uh, clean energy investment compared to basically current levels. This is historic in a way uh, because the energy sector as a whole has never achieved this type of volumes. The largest volume that the energy sector invested in um, over, over the history was around 2.5. 3 trillion. Here we need to have more than 4 trillion just for clean energy. Take the electricity sector. Uh, by 2030, uh, the amount of investment that would flow to the solar and wind industry is larger than what we have ever seen for fossil fuels. Important note here is that um, investment in clean energy alone will not be sufficient to actually materialize the CO2 savings that uh, we need. Uh, with this, what I mean is that government-driven investment in energy infrastructure are going to be essential. Here, we are talking about electricity grids, especially, because we have a huge increase in electricity demand, 40% increase, while at the same time, we are introducing variable renewables, solar and wind, which means that the need for expanding the grid is more essential than ever. So electricity grids require immediate attention, but at the same time, while we have huge sales of electric vehicles, we also need to make sure that our cities have uh, the necessary network to plug those new cars, the new bus fleets that would be electric, and so on and so forth. And at the same time, we need to start investing in hydrogen infrastructures, in particular ports, where um, we would start seeing trade of hydrogen and hydrogen being utilized at industrial facilities in those uh, ports. So a big push in energy infrastructure. Where would this lead us? This is actually uh, a big infrastructure and clean energy led economic boost. This is analysis that we were pleased to do with the International Monetary Fund. Continuing a cooperation we started uh, last year on sustainable recoveries. The finding is staggering, meaning that if we manage to materialize those investments, then the global economy would grow by a 0.4% a year, additionally from now to 2030. This would mean that globally we would have an economy larger by the size of a G7 country, that is Japan. This is huge, huge economic price. So there is a potential uh, new arm uh, in coming out of this uh, COVID deep uh, crisis that we are having in terms of boosting the global economy. Clearly, this comes also with creating millions of new jobs. In particular, the energy industry currently is employing already 40 million people. It would be able to generate around 14 million additional jobs, mostly in the electricity sector. So we are installing wind and solar, uh, but at the same time, uh, building new grids, batteries, and so on and so forth. Very important to note here, there are potential job losses, and those are significant as well. It's 5 million potential job losses that you're talking about, concentrated in coal and oil uh, community-dependent uh, areas. So uh, this is uh, extremely important to be tackled by policymakers immediately because the clean energy transition has to be for and about people. So we need to make sure that those workers, those communities, those countries, those regions that are dependent on fossil fuels do not suffer disproportionately. So the, 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 there is a bit of silver lining in the sense that 
For example, core workers, core miners have exactly the uh, skills that are needed for a big booming part of the uh, industry that is uh, needed for the energy transition, in particular, critical minerals, lithium mining. Well, those workers uh, where there is geographic compatibility could move and shift into this uh, new booming sector. Equally, oil and gas workers that are, for example, employed in the offshore sector could also transition to the booming uh, offshore industry. But this requires uh, careful local uh, policy designs. There is not only the 14 million jobs that are created directly in the energy sector, there is also a further 16 million workers that could be created, generated new employment in clean energy and uses. What are those? Those are new electric vehicles, but also buildings retrofits, um, new efficient appliances, and so on and so forth. Now, we looked at the skills level required here, and uh, we are not quite there in terms of the pipeline on new um, vocational programs uh, and really education programs that would deliver the medium to high skill requirements for this uh, decade. So another attention for area for policymakers is making sure that this potential 13 new million jobs uh, are there. We need to make sure that uh, we also prepare uh, those new waves of workers. Now, if we uh, look at the period to 2030, we said very clearly, we need to push investment, we need to push the non clean energy technologies that are already there. But there is a big end, an important end that we need to do at the same time is to prepare for the uh, next phase of emission reduction. What does it mean? We find that while we have basically all the technologies needed for the emission reductions in this decade, is not the case for the emission reductions post-2030. Why is that? If you look at sectors like uh, uh, heavy transport, like industry, cement, iron and steel, aviation, the technologies uh, that uh, could uh, reduce emissions in some sector are under development. They have not reached fully the market there, and they're not yet competitive with the alternative. So we need to work very hard on those to make sure that the savings is in the period 2030-2050 move to what, the, what we are calling the harder to abate sector. Here we are giving you a bit of a flavor of, of what are those technologies. Very clearly, hydrogen is an area where we think there has to go a lot of investment for hydrogen-based steel, but beyond. Advanced batteries is a critical area to make sure that uh, not only we, we uh, match the new flexibility needs that are needed in the electricity sector, but uh, we can also operate trucks uh, and cars eventually on uh, those advanced uh, battery types. Director capture is another area which uh, we think is going to be crucial. Uh, it's very difficult to think that by 2050, all the sectors will need, uh, will manage to reach zero. We may need some negative emissions. And at the same time, we need synthetic fuels um, in aviation. And direct capture could um, be essential to produce the CO2 uh, molecule that we need with hydrogen to produce synthetic fuels. So overall, uh, we estimate that while we push the quadrupling of wind and solar, the electric vehicles and, 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 and so on, as we mentioned earlier, and efficiency, we need to push uh, clean energy research and development. And our estimate is we would need around $90 billion in demonstration by 2030. We are currently far from having this uh, investment pipeline. What you're also finding is that uh, looking at history of uh, uh, clean energy technology, uh, is very rare, if uh, uh, known, uh, that there is one country only that manages to do the entire chain from the demonstration to bring into the market. So we find that, especially for the hard to abate sector, we need important and greater international cooperation because otherwise we have estimated that we would need three decades longer to reach net zero. So international co cooperation, especially in the other to abate sectors, in especially in the areas that we are identifying here, advanced batteries, hydrogen, the capture, are going to be essential if you want to globally 
meet net zero by 2050. What's important to note in this journey is that energy security concerns remain. Uh, some of them are the usual concerns and we add new ones. First of all, if you look at oil supply, very clearly demand is gonna drop in this scenario from 90 million barrels today to 24 million barrels in 2050. So we still have oil used in this scenario. Uh, it's concentrated in what we call non-energy use, so what are those? Um, it can be plastics, it can be asphalts, um, but those as energy uh, are, are oil use that uh, we're still having over the next 30 years, despite the huge plastic recycling, despite uh, all uh, the material efficiency, despite the phase out in, um, in some sectors such as, such, such as cars of direct oil use, oil remain, oil use remains. And what happens is that uh, oil production is very highly concentrated in uh, low cost countries, most of them in the Middle East. And our expectation is that uh, this concentration will go to unprecedented uh, levels. So oil security uh, risks remain and need con will continue to need to be addressed on a concentration uh, need. At the same time, the energy transition needs critical minerals. Here you see in this graph from copper to nickel to graphite, lithium, they become essential and they grow very, very strongly. Now, those minerals are equally uh, very concentrated. And what we need to make sure is that the supply of those minerals that, is, that are used either in batteries or in the cables for uh, the electricity grids and become really essential also for renewables that uh, there is a um, smooth production of supply that doesn't hinder the uh, clean energy transition. So we have released a report just a couple of weeks ago on this specific topic, highlighting that this is a, an emerging and very serious new security risk for energy that has to be taken um, uh, very seriously by policymakers. Now, and finally, the electricity sector. The electricity sector becomes so critical for all our economies that the security of electricity supply becomes integral to the economic boost in our lives. Now, while electricity demand booms, at the same time, we are really living a new and unprecedented requirement for flexibility needs. Here you can see that our estimate is that globally they quadruple not the same in every region, but it doesn't matter. The direction of travel is clear. Flexibility needs are growing everywhere. So uh, from uh, cybersecurity uh, to ensuring that investments are there to meet supply and demand at every time, policymakers need to put on the agenda uh, very, very quickly electricity security to be watched immediately. Now, um, this uh, roadmap, uh, very clearly charts a path uh, from now to 2050, what needs to happen for every sector, for every technology globally, if we want to meet net zero by 2050. With the uh, wonderful team that uh, uh, has worked on this analysis, we have actually mapped out over 400 milestones from now to 2050 for every uh, sector of what would need to happen, the translation of uh, what the global goal of reaching net zero by 2050 would mean. Here we're just giving a bit of an optical um, preview of some of those, uh, of those uh, uh, targets and uh, milestones. Let me give you some of those uh, examples. Um, hydrogen. We need to push hydrogen tremendously over the next decade to reach, for example, 850 gigawatts of electrolyzers. The pipeline now, if you look at all projects, is in the order of megawatts. When you look at all these projects that are being discussed around the world, you are in the whole order of 100, 120, 50 gigawatts, but we need to push this much, much more. You see that before 2030, we have a couple of uh, important other milestones that I mentioned earlier, the, the boilers, the no new uh, need for unabated coal uh, plants. Another translation of the demand 
needs uh, declining for fossil fuel is that we would see already from this year, basically no new, new underlined oil and gas fields approved for development. So we will still need the investment in existing fields, but not on uh, in, new, in new fields. If you allow me, I'll go to another important milestones that we are setting globally, which is the electricity sector is the one that has to run this race even first, faster than the others. By 2040, we are seeing uh, globally, on average, uh, a net zero uh, sector globally, which means that some, some countries may still have uh, some um, emissions from, from electricity, uh, but others may have run a bit faster and farther and reached already a net zero uh, globally. In our analysis, we do take into account equity considerations so that uh, advanced economies uh, uh, get to net zero before developing one, while developing one uh, reach uh, universal access already by 2030. Let me give another Another important example that gives you the idea of the huge transformation this energy sector would uh, entail. It's about, uh, again, the electricity sector. By 2050, we find that 70% of electricity would be generated by solar and wind. All renewables would account for 90% of uh, all electricity by then. And if you look at the total primary energy supply, the first fuel is solar that is going to supply more than 20% of um, energy needs by 2050 from around 1% today would become the first fuel uh, overtaking oil in the 2040s and uh, become uh, the largest source of uh, supply for all of us in 2050. So uh, with this uh, very clearly uh, a major transformation for the energy sector. And uh, uh, I invite you all to navigate uh, not only uh, all these milestones, uh, but also all the data and all the analysis that we have uh, online, and we remain available to uh, reply all the questions you may have. And thank you, uh, the organizers, for having invited us to uh, present the report to this uh, very important annual conference. Thank you all. Thank you, Laura. And now we are going to uh, to have the, the presentation of uh, Edouard Miguel from uh, University of California, Berkeley. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak in this uh, very interesting session. Uh, I'm Edward Miguel. I'm a professor of economics at the University of California, uh, Berkeley in the United States. And uh, I'll be speaking on electrification and energy access in uh, Africa. So let me start with an image that I think may be familiar to a lot of people. This is an image of the world at night. This is from a few years ago, and you can see where there's large population centers around the world, large cities. Um, the sort of one exception to this connection between population and night lights uh, is sub-Saharan Africa. And you can see that, you know, there are certainly some areas especially in South Africa and some in Nigeria where we can see concentrations of nightlights. Uh, but even though there's almost a billion people living in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, most of the region is dark at night. And that's because electrification rates there are lower than in any other uh, part of the world. And that's really the starting point for my talk today and also uh, the research that I've carried out with collaborators uh, over the last decade or so trying to understand uh, electrification and energy access in sub-Saharan African settings. This is a, a summary figure that uh, comes from Afrobarometer, the survey firm, that uh, quantifies electrification rates. And these are from several years ago now. Uh, but what you can see if you look closely at this figure is that about half of the population in sub-Saharan Africa has regular access to electricity and about half either has no access or uh, maybe only occasional access, really due to reliability issues, for instance. Uh, so the energy transition in Sub-Saharan Africa is really halfway there, and there remains a long way to go until most people uh, have regular reliable access to uh, electricity. So uh, some of the questions that'll motivate uh, my, my talk today are, 
uh, the following. First, how should electrification occur in sub-Saharan Africa? Should the focus be on the national electricity grid or should it be on home solar solutions or microgrids or other, uh, other options? Second, who should be electrified? Which populations, which regions, which types of facilities or firms, et cetera, um, should be electrified first? Who should be a priority? And third, when should electrification happen? Should these investments be happening right now? Is it an urgent um, sort of need or should they potentially be, potentially be delayed to the future if there are more, uh, you know, if there are higher return investments that could be made now? And I wanna uh, focus in particular on a, a particular type of uh, investment in electrification that's been made over the last decade. And this is um, investments in rural residential electrification. So uh, in the last decade or so, multiple countries have made it a priority to try to connect households in rural areas. Many donors, including the World Bank and the African Development Bank, have prioritized rural residential electrification. And the program that uh, has gotten a lot of attention in East Africa, the region where I've worked the most, is the Last Mile Connection Program in Kenya, which has um, connected already millions of rural households. Uh, there's several really attractive features of focusing on rural residential electrification. You know, one thing for sure is that uh, some of the current home solar systems have limitations. Sometimes they can't accommodate um, appliances with high wattage, so they have sort of limited uh, use for, for many um, you know, applications that households want to use power for. Uh, connections to the grid in a sort of you know, uh, coordinated way could address that by giving uh, people access to, to uh, you know, uh, power with fewer of those limits. Second, uh, a big uh, plus potentially of rural residential electrification is that these programs are targeted to the poorest. Rural areas tend to be the poorest uh, regions in most countries, including in sub-Saharan Africa. And so it's attractive to try to bring power to those populations. In particular, I'm gonna study a project that I've been working on with colleagues since about 2013, 2014, called the Rural Electrification and Power Project uh, which we carried out in Kenya, and actually we started working on several years before the government of Kenya expanded the last mile connection program that I just mentioned. So um, the, the data that I'm talking about has been almost like a trial run of what would happen or what is happening in rural Kenya when households get connected to the national electricity grid. What's unusual about our project is we carried it out as a randomized control trial in collaboration with government of Kenya uh, agencies, in particular, the Rural Electrification Authority. And also we, we coll we've collaborated with uh, Kenya Power on this. Uh, the, the RCT was carried out across 150 villages in Western Kenya. There was a randomization into which villages received free electricity connections and in which villages the status quo continued, that was the control group. And then we carried out detailed measurement and surveys in several thousand households to try to understand the effects of connecting rural households in Kenya uh, to the grid. Uh, this work has been published in several papers. One of the recent ones is with my co-authors, Kenneth Lee of the University of Chicago and Catherine Wolfram also of Berkeley. Uh, and that was published uh, last year in the Journal of Political Economy. So what happens when connections are given to, to rural households? We followed up these households um, at one year, at three years, and then at five years after connections were made. And we found something that was quite surprising to us, at least initially, which is we did not find any detectable or meaningful impacts of connections to the electricity grid on these households economic outcomes, their earnings didn't increase, their labor supply didn't change, their spending patterns didn't change. We also don't find significant gains in a pretty wide range of non-economic measures that we collected from child education. We even carried out in the field some additional academic assessments of children in these households to see if they were learning more, maybe because they could study at night with better access to lighting. We don't see effects there no effects on, on health outcomes, no effects in reducing crime because of better lighting. Um, so 
this was a you know kind of disappointing set of outcomes up to five years later we did not see transformative impacts in rural households that had been connected to, to the electricity grid um, and then our data also sheds light on why and you know one thing that comes through both in the surveys when we ask households and also in the patterns in the data is that it appears that many of the rural households in rural Kenya were just too poor to make the kinds of complementary investments that needed to be made to benefit from power. So, you know, a connection to the electricity grid is not like connection to the water grid. If you're connected to water, you can just drink the water directly and use it. With electricity, you need appliances. You need to be able to purchase those appliances in order to use electricity. And if you're a very poor household, those may be too expensive for you. Um, beyond that, even when households did have some appliances, they tended to consume very little power month to month. So uh, again, they seem to be too poor to really make use of these free electricity connections overall. There were a subset of households that were richer at baseline, better off households that appeared to use power more and use it better and, and experience some economic gains. So there is some variation in how power was used, but on average overall, we did not detect meaningful impacts in rural Kenya from these connections to power. Now, it's not just in Kenya where there's been some related results. There's a paper from several years ago by uh, Fiona Berlig of University of Chicago and Louis Prionis uh, of University of Maryland that finds similarly disappointing effects of connections to the grid in rural India. That was part of a national rural electrification program there. So now several sets of results are pointing in the same uh, same direction. Okay, so that's one set of findings. I want to mention one more set of issues that's very relevant during the COVID period and, and this whole overall question of energy transitions during COVID, um, which is related to some new research that I've produced with co-authors, Ken Lee again, Catherine Wolfram again, uh, but also Eric Sue and Oliver Kim uh, and Pierre Bisquet from, uh, from Berkeley, as well as Stephen Puller and Susanna Burkauer from UPenn Wharton. Um, we are, uh, like many of you, interested in what's happening to the sector during COVID. And actually, you know, given the crisis, a number of governments have prioritized subsidizing access to electricity um, during the pandemic, seeing electricity as an essential service and wanting to make sure that households could continue consuming uh, power even during the crisis. We studied how much households value access to electricity versus access just to money. So that's a kind of obvious alternative. Um, in two parallel randomized controlled trials, one carried out again in Kenya, both rural and urban Kenya, and another one carried out in urban Ghana. So what do we find uh, in this study? The question that we asked is when given the choice in uh, the randomized controlled trial between mobile money transfers or uh, electricity tokens, and again, these are prepaid metering systems. So, uh, you know, households could get these tokens and then upload them to their meter and get access to power. When given that choice in Kenya, almost no households chose the electricity tokens. They very much prefer just having access to uh, money. Now, there's a number of reasons why this may be the case. First, money, of course, you can use for anything. Um, second, I just showed you other results from Kenya suggesting that maybe demand for power among poor households isn't really that high or they don't really benefit that much uh, from it. So the data in Kenya was in urban areas when the households were given a one-to-one -one choice, $1 to $1 electricity tokens or cash, over 90% of them chose cash in, in uh, urban areas and almost 90% chose cash in rural areas. It was quite striking though, uh, an almost identical experiment was conducted in Ghana and the results were quite different. In Ghana, it was about half and half. Half the households chose cash, half the households chose electricity tokens. So this, uh, you know, we found this quite interesting in many ways, get, Ghana and Kenya are pretty similar countries in terms of average income levels. They're both um, really ahead of the curve in terms of electrification relative to their neighbors uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa. But when households were given these options in the two settings, they made very different choices. So we haven't fully sorted out exactly why there is this difference. This is new data and we're still, we're still studying it. But initially it seems like one important factor could be differences in the financial infrastructure in the two countries 
in particular, the fact that in Kenya, the mobile money infrastructure is simply much better developed than almost anywhere else in Africa or the world, uh, and certainly better than in Ghana. Uh, and so getting mobile money transfers are just very convenient in Kenya. You can use them to buy almost anything. Um, in Ghana, much less so. So in that sort of case, uh, when there are some transactions costs to using mobile money, about half the households in Ghana preferred electricity tokens. So there was a fair amount of demand for electricity relative to cash. All right, so this is just some, some initial evidence to give you a sense that different countries in Sub-Saharan Africa may have very different appropriate policies in the energy sector, including subsidizing power uh, during COVID as a function of other characteristics or other infrastructure. Uh, in those countries. All right, let me wrap up because I'm almost at my uh, 15 minutes. It's clear looking forward that the energy sector, the elect you know, electricity sector in sub-Saharan Africa are going to experience just decades of multi-billion dollar investments. There's a tremendous scope to electrify the rest of the region um, and certainly a lot of interest among donors uh, in doing so and among governments. Uh, a couple of punchlines, though, from the, the talk today that I want you to, uh, you know, take away. Remember, I opened up by saying, you know, how should we electrify? Who who should get power? You know, and when should we do it? Well, a lot of donor effort is going into electrification today for rural households, and the evidence that we uh, presented from Kenya, and the related evidence from India that I mentioned, suggests that the uh, benefits today to those rural residential electrification programs may not be very large. Households don't seem to demand that power in, in Kenya. They don't seem to benefit that much from access to electricity among poor rural households. And of course, during the COVID crisis, COVID is a health crisis, but also an economic crisis. And so anything that slows down economic growth or reduces living standards in rural areas in Africa is gonna make access to power potentially even less essential today relative to investments in agriculture, water, healthcare, education, and other basic services. It may be the case that households have to get sufficiently wealthy in order to really use power, to purchase the appliances that they need to make good use of power. All right, uh, so where should we invest if we're thinking about this from the point of view of policy? Well, during the pandemic, it would seem over the next year or two, as vaccination efforts are being rolled out uh, around the world, including in Sub-Saharan Africa, that electrification efforts in clinics, especially health clinics in rural areas, could have a very high return if they allow for easier distribution of vaccines that need to be refrigerated. So that would seem to be a kind of you know, obvious win in terms of investment, in addition to the more traditional investments in urban areas, industrial and commercial activities, where there, there are likely to be larger returns. Finally, and last point, in terms of how we should do this, I just want to put another call out there that I think you know, others have done about the important role of expanding generation capacity in renewables, in solar, in wind, where there's tremendous uh, potential in sub-Saharan Africa. This is very important for, for, for sub-Saharan Africa and, of course, for the globe, that as African energy access uh, expands in the coming decades, it's done in a way uh, that doesn't exacerbate all the challenges and problems uh, with climate change. All right, let me leave it there. Thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you uh, very much, um, Edward. And now we are going to move for the last presentations of Claudia Kempford from DRW Berlin. And then we will have the Q&A session. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much for having me and uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Claudia Kempfert. I'm energy economist, uh, professor of energy economics in Berlin. I will uh, show you the German perspective at this uh, point, And I have to illustrate that I'm also advisor of the German government at the moment. I'm part of the scientific advisory board uh, to the German government. Yeah, I will talk about the coal exit uh, Germany is doing right now. We had a recent uh, decision, a ruling from the federal constitutional court uh, that we have to take 
more action on climate protection. I will briefly illustrate uh, what this means, uh, what exactly German has um, has in mind and has decided and will decide uh, very soon uh, on climate policy and the energy transition. So let me let me uh, start by showing you um, some fundamental uh, issues uh, at this uh, point. Um, so the question is here, uh, Germany's coal exit uh, too little or too late? Uh, so we had a recent decision by the federal constitutional court in deciding um, that we have to take a climate policy action, not only by the year 2030, but also the year after or the years after 2030 in order not to shift the burden of climate protection to the future generations. That's quite fundamental and a very substantial ruling which has impact on the German government uh, immediately. But uh, just to show you, um, I mean, the session this afternoon is about also the energy transition, COVID and the energy system. Just briefly looking back um, on, the, on the past year in um, showing that there has been, of course, at the very early stage of the um, of the pandemic crisis, uh, reduction of primary energy demand, a reduction especially on transportation demand, which um, was also resulting to a demand decline of uh, primary energy um, carriers, for example, uh, coal and oil. And we saw also a shift, and that's quite interesting if we now uh, reflect the past to the future, we, we saw a shift uh, away from also coal on a global scale, on an OECD scale, uh, but uh, the share of renewable energy energies has been increased. And that is a trend uh, we see also in the future, we'll see in the future, of course, because now with the announcement also of the global governments uh, to take more action on climate protection, we will see in the future a greater transition towards more renewable, especially more uh, renewable energy. So that's one point. And um, as I already said, we see in the data that the share of coal is shrinking in the OECD um, countries, Americans and Europe, and also uncoupling the coal consumption and GDP growth, uh, which is quite visible uh, in many nations. It's obviously not true for all, especially China is constructing uh, also new coal-fired power plants, but now uh, looking at countries like the USA, uh, looking also on the announcements of a policy decision maker um, to take climate protection more seriously, we will see a further decline of coal also on the world scale, not only in Europe uh, related to the Green Deal, but also on the world scale, um, which is also reflected by the data. Now, looking at the future, we see a, a most recent report by the IEA, IEA in showing that uh, the future uh, is driven by renewables and that's largely solar pv and wind this is exactly our results we have shown uh, since uh, many years now um, that we need uh, also a full supply of renewable energy simply because renewable energy is becoming cheaper and cheaper and uh, we have to phase out fossil fuel in order really to reach uh, the 1.5 or the, uh, below two degrees Celsius a target, temperature target um, by the myth of the century. Now, looking at these numbers, it's quite interesting to see um, that we basically have or phasing a phase out of fossil fuels uh, in the next um, 20 years or 15 to 20 years from now on, and an increase, a substantial increase of renewable energy uh, in all uh, sectors. So key technologies which ramp up by 2030, that is the AEA, IEA report and showing um, that wind and solar are the key drivers of this uh, transformation. And a net zero pathway means also that we have to do a sector coupling, uh, that we have to electrify also different uh, sectors, not only energy saving and energy efficiency first, but also to use the um, green electricity on all relevant sectors in building sector, but also in transportation, 
uh, the electricity in the uh, on the road by electric cars or electric vehicles, uh, but also on railway uh, systems. So on the one hand, um, we need to do everything we can do to transform and to uh, save energy uh, in the building sector and also to avoid unnecessary transportation, uh, but on the other hand, to increase the share of renewable energy drastically uh, in order to meet uh, those targets. And that's pretty much in line of what we have shown in many studies in the last years. Um, and if we look at coal, especially because my topic here today is, is coal, um, that there will be uh, basically a, a largest amount of emission reduction coming from the coal sector. So the coal phase out uh, needs to be uh, sooner and needs to be more, um, more substantial uh, in the next years in order really to get, um, to get the emission uh, reduction targets uh, in the next uh, 10 years. So um, the total, um, if we're looking, this is uh, still the IEA scenario and showing that uh, the emission reduction uh, is coming basically in the power sector from a, a phase out of coal. Now, um, I wanted to focus on, on Germany, but just a, a brief look at the European countries. So there is a coal phase out uh, in most of the uh, European countries, UK, we can name here, um, in uh, Spain and uh, the others. In Eastern European countries, this is where the Green Deal comes in. We will see a just transition path and also providing opportunities and chances and supporting mechanisms uh, to um, also have a faster uh, coal phase out. Also because we are now in Europe have a quite high CO2 prices of 50 euro per ton of CO2, which is quite substantial and reflects that there's a serious climate protection policy um, now in place and the emissions trading system at the market stability reserve is, is, is also working so that we have uh, that we are facing higher uh, CO2 prices now. If we want to dive down into, into Germany, just a, a brief look. I mean, UK is pretty much out of coal. So um, there, there is uh, um, um, a short amount of coal uh, left, um, but um, the, the government already decided to, to pretty much phase out it uh, very soon. Um, there will be um, a substantial and has been a substantial decline of coal um, demand uh, in the past. and. Uh, the other two countries, which is also Poland, but Germany are still um, have still high capacities of coal and um, also coal mining. Um, and if we look at Germany, we have an installed coal capacity of approximately um, 50 gigawatts still. It's declining now because uh, of the coal phase out plan, which I will explain in a minute, but um, also because um, the high CO2 price, but also because uh, we have a specific mechanisms where companies can apply uh, to get compensation if they um, phase out uh, some power plants uh, sooner um, than initially planned. So there is still a high dependency on coal, but um, there is a transformation ongoing, and how this is how this is working, um, I will show you uh, in a minute. If we are looking now in the past of the um, coal history in Germany, um, there has been a long history. Uh, with the uh, European coal and steel uh, sector uh, community in 1951. Um, so you see that we had a huge employment, uh, large mining uh, also of hard coal in Germany, but uh, this employment um, situation of the jobs has been declined uh, drastically uh, within the last uh, decades. I mean, looking back at the last uh, 60 years, of course, um, we, we had uh, in the beginning of uh, of um, the uh, beginning of 1960s, uh, there were 600, over 600,000 people employed in the coal sector. Um, and now there are approximately 30,000 in total um, grass uh, jobs uh, left. And um, we had a big discussion about this uh, jobs, how to help them, how to provide a structural change. Uh, I will talk uh, in a minute. Um, but uh, now, um, if we are talking um, and looking at the climate uh, policy situation right now, um, we see that there, um, we, we had a decision 
uh, for climate policy goals, uh, which you see here um, in in this uh, picture and this graph in this graph, and it's showing that um, there is now a decision to phase out a coal by a linear path. So um, a, um, a really a phase out, which shows that um, there will be a decline uh, of individual coal power plants uh, in uh, by the next 15 years. So um, from, the, from the current policy point of view, there is uh, the plan uh, to uh, shut down the last, uh, the, um, the last coal power plant in uh, 2038, if everything is going on this plan. Uh, however, we looked at the numbers and uh, looking at what did we decide for the climate uh, policy, the Paris Agreement, uh, we, should, we would need as much a steeper uh, reduction of emissions also in the power sector, uh, which means uh, that we uh, would need a phase out of coal um, by 2030 and not 2038. So maybe right now, because of the market-driven uh, coal phase out of some coal power plants, we uh, might reach that. But now, uh, after the ruling of the federal constitutional court uh, in saying, well, we need also to take into account that after 2030, we should not postpone um, the climate uh, burden or the effort for climate protection after 2030, that means actually looking at the numbers and the carbon budget, which we still have left, that we would need a coal phase out by 2030 latest. Um, so, but um, that's actually uh, what, what the current government is facing. So what's happening, what happened in the last weeks were after this ruling of federal constitutional court, um, there has been a, an immediate action, an immediate reaction by the German government in saying, well, we are adjusting uh, the current climate goals, uh, which we had previously for 2030 and 2040, uh, we have to take it, them into account uh, and also have a steeper or decided to have a steeper emission reduction pathway right now uh, with the uh, current situation. So in, in two weeks almost, uh, they have decided um, to, to change that. And you know that we are in the middle of an election year in September, Germany is electing a new government. Uh, so there is a lot of uh, actionism right now in uh, showing well we, we are taking uh, climate change uh, seriously and doing a lot on, on climate protection. Um, so there is now the decision to reduce emissions even steeper. And that means, um, that would mean, I mean, uh, realistically, a real coal phase out by 2030. That means also a lot for the transportation sector, for the building sector and all the rest. Uh, but uh, for the for in order really to be realistic, uh, we have to phase out coal by 2030. Now, talking about uh, the coal benefits. So uh, what we all made with this, we had a, a coal commission and providing recommendations for the structural changes. Um, so the employment effects are taken into account. We are spending um, 40 billions uh, to help the affected regions um, by uh, providing enough uh, financial aid uh, to, uh, to really manage the structural change. That was before Corona, but now also within the after the Corona crisis or within the Corona crisis, there's a lot of financial aid also going into um, the uh, loading infrastructure for electric vehicles and helping also in regions uh, to provide um, attractive economic conditions for new companies and uh, to increase the share of renewable energy and also help um, electric car companies uh, to or the car companies in general uh, to be to um, make the structure change as well, which is also related uh, to the full transformation of the energy uh, system to all different sectors. Now, so what we really need is uh, policies to enable a transition to 100% renewable path. And that is what actually means if we're looking at the emission reduction uh, numbers. Um, there were this uh, coal phase out, most likely by 2030, we will see what the future government, what the next government will do after September. Um, but as for sure is that we need a transition to a 100% renewable energy uh, system. So more, a steeper increase of renewables, a better support of renewable energy, a much faster increase of the share of solar 
and wind as the IEA scenario is also confirming um, and also to phasing out not only coal but also the other um, the other fossil fuels uh, like oil and uh, of course also uh, natural gas at a certain point in time uh, so that's exactly what the transition will go for and that's what the German um, government uh, will most likely decide. We will not know who will be the next government, but uh, anyhow, uh, the coalition will go in this kind of uh, direction. There's not, it's not likely that they will move and go back uh, to coal and nuclear at all. Uh, so the only alternative is a 100% uh, renewable energy. And this um, Transition from conventional to 100% renewable is, um, is a process. We need a energy system transformation, more decentralized system, more flexible system, more digital system, uh, but also in um, providing, uh, especially those areas with the structural changes, going away from mining of coal towards um, also mining of solar in, in a certain sense and, and provide the system uh, with, full, um, with full supply. There's a hot debate right now in Germany, what kind of measures are really relevant. Uh, we have the CO2 price on the, on the emissions trading system. Uh, we have now decided to have a CO2 price also on, um, on fuels and heating uh, fuels. Um, and this should also decrease emissions, but we need more instruments also to um, offer this uh, or to allow the sector coupling uh, that we use the electricity and the heating uh, system as well and in the transportation system as well. Um, so what we will do also is to talk about uh, a further adjustment of energy taxes, uh, a higher CO2 tax, um, but also lower, lower taxes for renewable electricity. Uh, and that is under debate uh, right now. So what's, what will happen is that we will phase out the, the um, coal uh, as soon as possible. That's uh, what uh, the, um, the current government and also the future government has to do. But at the same time, and that's actually not discussed and also not really uh, in the public debate is how to manage the full transformation, how a system of full supply of electricity and renewable and electricity will look like. What about the sector coupling and not only load infrastructure, but also railway improvement is needed uh, and all the rest in order really to, to get a full system of renewable energy. Uh, we have shown and did a lot of simulations uh, for Germany, for Europe, uh, that a full supply of uh, renewable energy is uh, feasible feasible, technically feasible, it's economically efficient, uh, but what we need clearly is a political will in order uh, to reach that. So that's exactly what we need right now. That is under debate at the moment. Um, and we show in our simulations, as you can see here, um, that uh, there are different, um, I mean, ways in providing a full supply of renewable energy in each country. It's feasible. Uh, we are doing it with a, with a full a model for Europe um, and a full energy system model in uh, showing the uh, results. So if you're interested, we can uh, send it uh, to you. So just to sum up, uh, the full coal phase out in Germany is now too little, still too little. It's also too late if we are looking at the climate policy goals. So what uh, is likely? What happened right now is that there is an adjustment of the climate targets, uh, which um, means that there will be well, a need to, there will be a need to uh, phase out coal inevitably by 2030 but the next government has to decide on that and has to do it um, if we take this seriously um, and what is also missing is a rapid expansion of renewable energy um, so we still have a lot of market barriers um, we need an adaption of the framework conditions uh, for, the, for a better integration of renewable energy. Uh, this is um, not really debated, so we need to do much more on this. So this is just to briefly um, give you an input of how the situation in Germany is. What about the coal phase out? It's too little, too late, but I'm happy to go for the discussion. Thank you so much.
Thank you uh, for uh, this uh, very nice presentation, uh, Laura. Um, sorry, Claudia. And now uh, it's uh, the, the time for the, the Q and A. So I have um, I have highlighted three questions. Uh, uh, one, the first for uh, Patrick Pouyanné. Um, and the, the first question is something around um, you, you present us uh, many challenges and. Uh, the, for total energy, and uh, some questions comes around what is the um, uh, the crucial one, what is the more complex one uh, in, in your situation to to address. Uh, your mic is closed. I think the, the most complex issue for us is the pace of the transition, because fundamentally, and I was reading the IEA report uh, this weekend. We agree on the landing point. What is the scenario, the energy mix in 2050, if uh, we want to be carbon neutral? There is one big difference, which is the way to get here. And in particular, it is at the same time to prepare the future and to provide uh, the present, I would say. Because today there is a mix, which is plenty of fossil fuel, maybe too much, but that's the reality of the planet. And you know, in this scenario, the IEA, uh, the, for us, what makes a huge difference between their scenario and our scenario is that uh, between 2020 and 2030, there is a decrease of demand of oil of 30%. And frankly, I do not see where it will come from. Uh, the scenario said in 2035, we'll move to EVs for light vehicles, which I agree, uh, only EVs from 2035. And that has a big impact, obviously, on the demand by 2050, 15, 20 million barrels of oil per day. But to decrease by 30% in the next 10 years, uh, without a magic tool, I don't know how to do it. Or oh, that means that people, customers have to renounce to use oil. Uh, and, and there is no, and so it's back to the big debate in the transition, which is, it is a matter of supply or is it a matter of demand? It is obviously a matter of supply in terms of investments heavily in renewable and electricity, because we know by climate neutrality, we'll go with much more electricity and renewables. But it is a matter of demand when we speak about the transition. And I, there is no magic tool. Again, I don't know if we could have a decrease of the demand of 30% in the next 10 years. And so for my company, this is a real debate, in fact. Uh, should we give up our customers today uh, and so not, not produce any more oil, uh, which by the way, would, I would l lose the source of the revenues to invest in renewables, so it would not work economically. But at the same time, that means that uh, uh, if there is no drive on the demand, and that should come from policymakers, that should come from carbon taxation, uh, the, the customers will not change their behaviors just because we decide in an Excel file but we will win, we'll make energy efficiency of 4% per year, like in the scenario, uh, the net zero scenario of EIA. Because today we are doing less than 2% per year. Even if we know that energy efficiency is at the core of the transition as well. So, I mean, that's something where we cannot do it alone together. So for me, it is a crucial debate, the pace. And for a company like Total, people think we should give up immediately for fuel. It's just by doing that, if Total is doing, by the way, it will have no impact at all on the climate change because, you know, I was in Russia last week and they are very happy to see that most of the market will go to them and to OPEC countries. So I think that's a crucial point uh, fundamentally. And how do we, on one side, make a big push on the supply? And I am in favor of that. And we have adapted the strategy of Total Energies in order to invest more and more and more in this renewable. Uh, but at the same time, if we want to cope the present and the future, we need to have a push on the demand and it will not come just because we declare it. And that's the most complex part, because you should not forget as well that customers of energy, they want fundamentally an affordable energy. And so all that is a matter at the end of price and cost. And it's time we speak about carbon pricing, we go to that issue. So the equation is a affordability, uh, net zero cleanliness and transitioning, but again, demand, not only supply. 
Thank you. So Laura, there is a couple, not a couple, there is multiple questions uh, regarding your net zero uh, scenario. And uh, there is uh, a bunch of questions around the role of gas, the role of hydrogen uh, in the, the net zero uh, path to, uh, uh, to, to 2050. So could you comment a bit on the, the role of gas? Thank you, thank you, Yannick. And uh, uh, if you allow me, I will also pick up something that Monsieur uh, Puyane vient de dire, and it's very important. Uh, so I think, first of all, what have we tried to do with this, uh, uh, with this analysis is really translate what government's high-level pledges uh, would mean for the energy sector. So far, there's been a lot of discussion of what uh, 1.5 means, what net zero by 2050 means, but there was no real clear understanding for the energy sector. If you want to do it in practice, what are the key milestones to make that happen? So this is what we have done, a translation. Now, uh, I, I mentioned this also in the talk, a lot of the media focused on three things, which were, uh, we wouldn't need any more um, unabated coal. We wouldn't, we wouldn't need the new investment in oil and gas from now on. But there are 400 milestones that we put there, 90% of which are demand related. So I think what Patrick is saying is crucial here to understand. If you don't do the demand job, so the 90% of the 400, then you don't get the profiles for oil, for gas, for coal that have consequences for investment. This is, a, a, I think, a crucial important point. So um, I can get, then go to the two, three uh, other points that are equally important. The role of gas. Gas is actually growing in our scenarios in the mid-2025, until mid-2025, and then starting to go down to around 50% current level. Um, important thing is that gasos fuels, gasos fuels uh, basically account for the same share as today in 2050. But what happens to them? They decarbonize. They decarbonize fast. And this is very much a story of uh, investment of companies that know how to do certain things. And they switch. They switch to, to hydrogen. They switch to uh, synthetic gases. They switch to um, biomethane. So this is, this is the role uh, that we are seeing uh, for gases. Hydrogen, for us, is a clearly big winner. And the production of this hydrogen is, is coming from many different ways. So it's not only. Uh, through electrolysis, is natural gas is yes, is also very much, uh, very much present. Uh, final point, because uh, uh, I, I realize we are, we are very short on, uh, on time. Uh, if you look at investment in fossil fuels, actually they don't go to zero tomorrow. If you look at today's investment levels, we are around 360 billion. They went up to, compared to last, to last year. And we are in our scenarios around this level up to 2030s. Uh, and this is very much, very much driven for by the major oil companies. And I need to say that what uh, Patrick said in terms of uh, changing portfolio, etc. Uh, we have to say that some of the European um, uh, oil and gas uh, companies last year, for the first time, they actually increased the share of investment away from oil and gas to up to 10%. This is not something that we're seeing universally. So it's something that has to be to be really praised in terms of. Uh, shifting, uh, shifting focus, and I would, uh, I would stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Laura. Uh, so, Edward, it's your turn to answer uh, the burning question uh, for our, for Africa. Uh, some people in the chat ask for, uh, did you try to to transfer the token into food, uh, and uh, not not to transfer a token into energy, but in more even basic things. Uh, related to poverty, so um, real access to food. Would uh, thanks. Uh, that's a very good question, and I think uh, I thank the the, the viewer for, for asking that. Um, the reason we didn't do something like that was really a question of how practical it was. Uh, the idea behind mobile money and electricity transfers is they're very easy to transfer to people's phones. And in a setting like Kenya, where mobile money is so widespread, almost all households have access to it. So this was really just a logistical kind of practical question. But I, I do you know, thank the, the viewer for asking that question. Uh, certainly in the case of Ghana, where mobile money is not that widely used, transferring uh, mobile money to them may just not be uh, a very good, um, may not be very valuable. So uh, I, think, I think it is a very good question. Um, you know, more broadly, there's, there's the question of 
um, you know, what, what are the key essential services? And those of us in development economics, you know, ask that question all the time. Clearly during the pandemic, food would be very, very valuable. So yeah, thank you for that question. So thank you all for um, participating in this keynote session. Unfortunately, we, we have to, to close down the, the discussion. As usual, we would have loved to spend two hours more, but uh, as you know, uh, time is scarce for everyone. So I would like to really uh, thank you from the uh, EIE point of view uh, and uh, from my personal side too for this very lively session and uh, the, the topics covered.